So, there's a lot of things to be angry about, and I'm not hearing that kind of anger expressed at tea party rallies. Not the kind of anger that we all share. And so, I think it's also important to recognize, folks, that the kind of political anger that I'm describing, that you're feeling, is a righteous anger. And I use that word very intentionally and very carefully, knowing full aware that, that we're in a Unitarian church. And as my grandfather, the Baptist preacher, would say, Unitarian church is sort of like a church. It's very similar. <laughs> Unitarian is love, Unitarian is love that joke, by the way. Uh, but really, think about it. You know, it is a righteous anger, and I use that word very intentionally. It's a righteous anger because if you get angry and you just stew in your anger, that's not righteous anger. In fact, that's an anger that's dangerous emotionally, physically, psychologically, and spiritually. You see, righteous anger requires action. If you're going to get angry at injustice and have it be righteous anger, it has to propel you into action. May I suggest it was righteous anger that propelled the abolitionist movement in this country. Because those people were angry about the depraved institution of slavery. It was righteous anger that propelled those women at Seneca Falls to stand up against the patriarchy and make demands, political demands. It was righteous anger that fueled the trade union movement. It was righteous anger that propelled the civil rights movement. Righteous anger is a good thing because it tells us we're going to stand up against injustice and we're going to demand justice. We're going to demand fairness. We're going to make systemic, fundamental change and we have done that in this country before and we're going to damn sure do it again. So yes, I'm angry. And I also want to acknowledge something. I'm also angry because I can remember what it was like to say that I was a proud and patriotic American with no other qualifier. And for me, that's when I was a little boy. When I was taught that I was from the United States of America. The land of the free and the home of the brave. And that my country stood for liberty and justice and equality. And I was so proud to be from that country. And not only that, but my country was like some great shining light on the hill. And it was going to guarantee liberty and justice and equality to the entire world. And as a little boy, obviously, I didn't understand all the implications of that. But at its root, what I understood was my country was fair. My country was good. My country stood for things that I believed in. And when I grew up, I realized I had been lied to. But I want to be clear, it's not the kind of lie that we normally think about. Because I have a name and a face for the person I associate with what I will now call the creation myth that I was subjected to. And for me, that person is Mrs. Armstrong, my fifth grade teacher. <laughs> and may I ask, are there any current, future, or former public teachers in this crowd? Would you raise your hand? Can we get a round of applause for our public teachers? <laughs> I mean, uh, seriously. For two reasons. Number one, I don't think we thank public teachers enough in this country. I mean, we damn sure don't pay you enough. But I also want to get a round of applause for these teachers and in honor of Mrs. Armstrong. Because you see, Mrs. Armstrong did not go to bed at night saying, ah, 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 ah. I can't wait till these children come into my classroom so I can fill their mind full of lies and propaganda about how this country operates. No! Mrs. Armstrong was a public teacher. And as a public teacher, like every other public teacher I've ever met, she wanted to teach children to be productive members of society. She was doing her best to nurture young minds. You see, she taught that creation myth because she believed it. And that creation myth worked on me because I wanted to believe it. And as I'm looking out at you, I can see it worked on most of you by simply the way that you're reacting to me because you wanted to believe it. And I suggest that you wanted to believe in liberty, justice, and equality not because you're Americans, but because you're human beings. That all human beings want and deserve liberty and justice and equality. These are human rights. And you know what? Iraqi children want that too. And so do Israeli children and Palestinian children. So do Guatemalan children and Mexican children and Senegalese children, children all over the world. And I think that what we're seeing happening in this worldwide democracy movement that is sweeping the planet in which ordinary people are coming into their own sense of power is a recognition that there is a human rights movement taking place and it's about time it came to the United States. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
my time together, I'm going to do my best to tell the truth as I see it. And in order to do that, I'm going to tell a story of how it came to be that these large transnational corporations are not just exercising power, but they are ruling us. They are actually making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect our lives, where we're left to choose between paper and plastic at the grocery store, Coke or Pepsi. We're given a myriad of consumer choices if you have enough money. But when it comes down to how our society actually operates, we have virtually no mechanism to actually meaningfully participate in making and shaping those decisions. So in order to tell that story, I want to make sure that we cover four concepts together. The first concept we're going to cover is democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot in this country, and in fact, each of our speakers I was listening used it at least once. So that word is very important, and to make sure we've got some clarity around it, I'm going to ask this question. What language is this from? Greek. It's from Greek. Let's break it down. Demos means? The people. Kratia means? Rule. Perfect. So really simply put, the word democracy means the people rule. Does anybody believe we, the people, are ruling in the United States today? Don't be shy. <laughs> right? I do this presentation all over the country. Usually, the, like literally every night, a different community, sometimes two different communities in the same day, virtually no one will actually say, yes, we may have some problems, but the people rule in the United States. You know what, folks? That's a problem. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. Although, i got to say this. The fact that nobody's raising their hand when asked that question is actually a good thing. How can that be? What do I mean? I think it's a good thing that we're finally disabusing ourselves of the mistaken belief that we actually have a democracy. That we're finally growing up politically and looking at truth and reality in the face and realizing that we're going to have to actually do something about it. What I have to see it is the most dangerous threat to a democratic republic in the United States of America is the mistaken belief that we have one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, that will bring me to my next topic that I want to make sure that we cover, and that's the word sovereignty. This is also a very important word. Can anybody give me a couple of three, def three or four word definition of that? Or how about this? Even better. If I merely have the word the sovereign up there, and I... I said, the sovereign. Who or what would you think of? King. The king. And that's because the king was sovereign. The word sovereignty means the authority to rule. Whoever or whatever has the authority to rule in a society is the sovereign. And 500 years ago, the word king and sovereign were synonymous because the king had absolute authority to rule. And where did the king claim his authority? God. God. You don't get more legitimate. Right? I mean, if you say that you're able to speak for God and have all the society believe you, that's pretty powerful. And in order to really illustrate that, let's do a quick little exercise. This is always a lot of fun for me. <laughs> You'll see. I'm going to invite this entire congregation to please close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. <laughs> I told you it was a lot of fun for me. And as the king, David is God's representative on earth. And therefore, everything David says must be obeyed. Okay, I want to. Oftentimes, I say, "Okay, open your eyes," but I'm looking around. Not a single person in this crowd is still closing your eyes. That's a good thing. Congratulations. Uh, I also want to point out a couple of things. Number one, all of you chuckled or laughed as soon as you heard what I was asking you to repeat. Right? You noticed that. And I also want to acknowledge this. That this woman. Uh, the sister who I haven't uh, met, she actually said, oh, no, out loud. I don't know if you heard it. This gentleman was shaking his head, no, right? This fellow up here who had been listening very intently to me kind of looked at me funny. He looked like he was buying a lemon, right? He didn't like it one bit, right? And the thing is, the reason that I want to point this out is that all of you laughed about that because it's funny, right? I mean, and not funny as in, oh, David just told a very witty, humorous joke funny, but stupid funny, ludicrous funny, ridiculous funny, right? I mean, to think that I should tell this gentleman how he can live his life simply because of who my parents are, that's laughable, that's ridiculous. Even better, that I should be allowed to say how all of society ought to be organized simply because of the divine right of kings, that's preposterous. You have to laugh at that. That's funny. And 500 years ago, human 
beings just like us not only thought it, but they said it and they acted like it. And the reason that I really want to bring this home is to recognize this. If enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. And here is a way to say that, folks. And now the Texan will get metaphysical on y'all, so hold on. We are all individually participating in creating our collective reality. And so if it is true that this is a racist, sexist, and class oppressive society, then we are all participating in making it so. And frankly, we have some responsibility. And if we want to see a change, then we need to act differently. We need to think differently. And I think that's a big thing because, you know, it's true that I'm a Green Party uh, person. I'm proud of that. I'm proud to be a Green Party member. I am also proud to say that I've worked with progressive Democrats on a day-to-day -day basis. The Move to Amend Coalition includes progressive Democrats of America as an organization. I work with them every day, and I find them to be a wonderful group of human beings, and I appreciate that. You can applaud that. I will also say this. I work very closely with libertarians as well. When it comes to the Anti-Patriot Act legislation and anti-war work, nobody is more often on the front lines than libertarians. And I'm proud to work in coalition with libertarians. And I even work with Republicans on issues where I can find common ground. You see, I have a long history of working in a respectful coalition with anyone where I can find common ground on a particular issue. Let me tell you something, folks. For all my 30 years of political organizing, I have never had the privilege and the opportunity to work in coalition with a monarchist. <laughs> right? Think about it. I mean, the thing that 500 years ago was political reality for every European society and seemed unquestionable and unthinkable, today we can't even say it out loud without laughing. You can't find a single individual who would actually stand up and articulate that political school of thought. And folks, 500 years is the blink of an eye in world history in human history. And again, I'm saying this. We have to come to terms with the fact that we can make the kind of systemic change that we need if we will believe we have the power to do so. Honestly, that is the biggest threat is our own self-censorship, our own lack of confidence and faith in our ability to make change. If we would actually just begin to act collectively for a different world, we would have a different world. I want to come to the, last, to the third concept, and that is legal personhood. I want you to note that I did not put corporate personhood up here, but instead legal personhood. Because I want us to be clear that the concept of personhood in this context is very important. Because it means the ability to assert rights under law. If you have the ability to assert rights, that means that you are a person. Personhood has been a profound struggle and a fight throughout all of American history, and there's a reason for that. We'll come to that in just a moment, but I just want you to really understand that legal personhood, just the concept of personhood means the ability to assert your rights under law. The last concept that we're going to cover is corporation. Because that concept is so important, I'll ask this question. What language is that from? Does anybody know? It is from Latin. Let's break that word down. Corpus means body. And now for extra credit point, any of my Latin scholars. The suffix T-I-O-N means to have or give. So literally the word corporation means to have or give body. And that's because, and by body, I mean literally physical body. And let me ask really quickly, uh, any other lawyers in the room besides me and Mark? Mark, raise your hand, and I sell anybody else. So I'll just ask Mark, he's going to the lawyer. Mark, you remember in law school uh, where we were taught that a corporation is a legal fiction? Yeah. Yeah, Mark remembers that. In fact, that concept, that phrase is so often repeated that I'll ask this, in this entire congregation, how many of you have heard the phrase that a corporation is a legal fiction? Oh, look at all those hands going, right? A corporation is a legal fiction. So that begs the question, what does the word fiction mean? It ain't real, not true. Check it out. A corporation we are taught in law school does not exist in the physical world. But we will pretend like this group of people who are coming together to do a certain thing and all these resources, the material that might be congregated and all these 
contractual arrangements and agreements and all these social norms and so forth. We're going to pretend like that all these different things, that they are actually one thing. And if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. So poof, presto chenico, society creates a corporation. And by that I mean a corporation is a construct. It is literally created by us as a society, by the power of our imaginations, and for a reason. The first corporations <coughs> ever created by the genius of human beings were created during the Roman Republic. That's the reason that the word corporation is from Latin. And by the way, they were created during the Roman Republic, not during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we spent more time asking, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States. <laughs> just saying. You know, plant seeds, just plant seeds. But listen, the first corporations ever created as a construct were created for a reason, to do things. For example, the road system. Have y'all heard that phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Right? Well, that road system, that incredible network of roads, was actually designed by and built by a Roman corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula, that aqueduct system was designed, maintained, built by a Roman corporation. Likewise, the first universities, a Roman corporation. In fact, the first hospitals, John, can you guess? A Roman corporation. So here's a question, folks. What does a road system, a water system, a university, a hospital, what do they all have in common? Public benefit. Thank you so much. They're a public benefit. The idea of the corporation and the genius of the idea of the corporation was to take private money and to put it to public use. But I want to be clear about something. There's another way that the government might take private money for public uses. What's that called? Taxes. Taxes. And I want to be clear, I'm not here to denigrate taxes. I actually think that there is a perfectly valid uh, reason uh, to actually use a uh, taxing system. And, and by the way, not only is there a perfectly valid way to do it, but if it's done fairly, you can do some amazing things. By the way, let me just stop and say, the lie, the myth that we're in an economic crisis is not really true. It's more fair to say we're in an allocation crisis. Because actually, this economy is producing more wealth than any economy has ever produced in the history of human beings on this planet. You want to solve the budget problems in your local government, your state government, and the national government? Tax the rich. Problem solved. It's just that simple. It is just that simple. So I'm not here to denigrate taxes, but I want to ask you something. When it comes to taxes, does the tax collector say, would you be willing to pay your taxes? No. Does the tax collector say, could I entice you to pay your taxes? No, here's the thing, folks. The difference with the idea of the corporation is that it's private money on a voluntary basis. And that is genius, actually. And a corporation might be formed by simply asking, would you please donate to this, which is what we think in rough terms as a non-profit corporation? Or it might be, could I entice you to make an investment for which we hope to return you additional money, which we would think of roughly as a for-profit corporation? And I want to be clear, I'm not denigrating non-profit or for-profit corporations at all, because I think that this idea is a brilliant idea. It really is a wonderful idea. David Cobb is not anti-corporation. The move to amend coalition is not anti-corporation. We believe that corporations should exist. We believe that they have an important role to play in our society. We believe that they should be able to make money. But the problem is that the modern transnational corporation doesn't exactly operate that way, does it? That's because the modern transnational corporation actually has its roots in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. I have to put discovery in the imaginary air quotation, right? Because it's not accurate to say that the 14th, 15th, and 16th century of Europe was the age of discovery. After all, what did they discover? For that matter, who was they? They were Europeans. And what did they discover? Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash! There were people living there. They weren't lost. They didn't need to be discovered. 
So instead, let's just tell the truth. That is the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. There's one word that I think really captures it. It's the age of empire. Because that's what imperialism means. It means the willingness, the ability to brutally attack other people, beat them, kill them if you must, steal their resources away from them, and take their resources to your homeland. That's what imperialism actually means. And check it out. The modern transnational corporation was not only created during this time period of empire, the modern transnational corporation was created as an instrument of empire on purpose. In fact, one of the early famous joint stock companies or early corporations was a little outfit known as the East India Corporation that was literally designed to facilitate the subjugation of the entire subcontinent of India and then to steal their resources. Oh, and by the way, not only to colonize their bodies in the physical sense and to crush their existing institutions and replace their institutions with, quote, proper British institutions, but also to colonize their minds. And frankly, folks, I think that part of the problem in the United States today, so many of us are colonized in our minds. We have been taught to accept the circumstances in which we live, even though we know it's unjust, even though we know it's unfair, even though we know it's basically racist, sexist, and class oppressive, even though we know these economic institutions are destroying our legal system, we are taught to accept it. And if we're going to fight back, we can only fight back in limited ways that the ruling elites have already told us are the acceptable ways to, quote, fight back. And if that's the rule by which you play, you're not fighting back. Right. We have been colonized. And by the way, another one of those early corporations was an outfit known as the Africa Trading Company. Would anybody like to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? Thank you. Say that last one again, sir. Thank you so much. Because let me say something, and I'll just use myself as an example. When in my head, in my in my head, when I'm asked what did the Africa Trading Company trade, and the word slave pops into my head, that's an example of my colonized mind. Because now that we really think about it, was Africa populated by slaves? Of course not. Africa was populated by human beings. And may I say, folks, human beings basically just like me. And I say that fully aware of my skin color and my pigment. But I say it with conviction because I know that it's true. Because you ask any scientist, you ask any biologist, and she or he will tell you race does not exist. I mean, sure, skin color exists, pigment exists, even ethnicity exists. But no scientist would elevate those to a taxonomy or a classification. It doesn't make any sense. It's not true. But check it out. Race doesn't exist, but racism damn sure does. How can that possibly be? Why, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. So here it is, folks. The point I'm making here is race is a construct. It gets created by the imagination of human beings, and there's a reason for that, and that reason, pure and simple, is to justify slavery. Period. And, by the way, I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the corporation or imperialism created slavery, but it was a different attempt to justify it. Slavery before the construct of race was a little different. Sir, what's your first name? Fan. Fan. Let's say Fan and I belong to different tribes, and there's a river separating us, and my tribe goes to war against Fan's tribe, and my tribe wins the war, and, by the way, why do you think my tribe might win this war? More power. Better warriors. Weapons. I'm more aggressive. These are all phenomenally good suggestions or guesses, but they can only be guesses or suggestions, right? I haven't given you enough information for you to really know why. Should I tell you why my tribe wins the war against Fan's tribe? Because I'm telling a story. That's why. <laughs> ah! Which is to say, whoever is telling the story has inordinate power over that story. And we ought to actually recognize that today, when we turn on the media, corporate media, I don't care whether it's Fox News, MSNBC, 
ABC, CBS, NBC, or ABC. It's corporate media. They are telling the story, and we ought to be questioning why are they telling the story, and if we do that, we will get a lot further in understanding how our world is actually operating.